Margaret, Jeannie, and Azel that I saw walk in. It's great to see you. Great to have you. And uh, anyone from Hemet today? Welcome. Thanks for coming and uh, making the long drive in from the metropolis of Hemet. And, uh, you know, uh, Austin. Is, is Austin the guitar player? Where would you go, Austin? Is he still in the worship room with helping Zach out? Right. This is what caught my eye this morning. All right. He's going to kill me for taking his guitar up, but... I didn't know they provided drapes now for guitars. <laughs> I thought that was the coolest thing. I mean, I guess in the sh- you know when it gets too hot, you need to shade them and all that kind of stuff. I just thought that was cool. I'm gonna hang some of these from my pulpit next week, and uh, that'll be great. All right. Uh, by the way, next week we're gonna have a great time, and I hope you heard what Tevin said. Uh, dressed to the nines next week, so that means get dressed up in your very best. We're gonna have a uh, we're gonna have a really fun time with all of our kids. We also want to say a very special um, welcome to some of our newest members today. We've been doing a membership class uh, just about every Sunday morning on a a rotating basis. And some of them are here, some are away. It's a holiday weekend, but here's some of these folks. Sherry Lynn, Sean, Joy, Sherry, Carl, uh, Gaylord, Margaret, Amber, and Joseph, just some of our newest members. Can you give them a hand? Give them a hand. Thank you very much. Some of them are standing. Others, thanks very much. Way back there. Hi, Joy. Why are all my members sitting in the back row today? That's weird, huh? I guess that's what we told them to do. All right, there you go. Thanks so much. Um, A couple other things. Um, Yeah, it is VBS week, and it just reminds me that God loves kids. There was a young man, eight years old, Isaac. Isaac, Isaiah, and uh, he went to visit at his, uh, one of his grandparents' uh, office place, and it was owned by a Christian business person, and Isaiah was in there, and the reason he was there is because, unfortunately, mom and dad were going through a difficult divorce. I don't know one that isn't difficult, and, and uh, so the grandparents were taking care of Isaiah, and um, the boss asked Isaiah if there was anything coming up this summer that he was looking forward to, anything fun coming along, and and Isaiah kind of hung his head, and he just, I, he obviously had heard this repeated around, um, I don't know, a conversation with the adults, but he just kind of hung his head and said, we don't, we don't have any money for any fun this summer. And, and that, just, that, that just really uh, got to the, the businessman, and, and um, he felt like the Lord was prompting him to do something. Now, I know better than just to, to make a promise to an eight-year-old, uh, but he just immediately blurted out, what if I could get you to a Christian summer camp this summer? Wouldn't that be amazing? And I bet he realized after he got that out, maybe I should talk to mom and dad first. But he didn't, and the, Isaiah got all excited. And he had to follow through, and, 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 and he did follow through, and, it, and the, the business owner later said, you know, that was just one of the, the, the best experiences of my summer, just having that opportunity to bless that kid. And folks, I got to tell you that God cares about children. He cares about uh, those that are, uh, that are doing great. He, he cares about those that are uh, maybe hurting at this time. He cares about those that, that will be joining us here for VBS this week. Uh, that which you do, your tithes and offerings, really make what we're going to be a part of this week, um, it happens. It makes it a possibility. Uh, right now, we have about 120 kids uh, registered, and if this is anything like last year, we'll add like 50 to 60 kids by about Tuesday, Wednesday, and it will grow throughout the week. And so we're going we're gonna to climb up close to 200 kids this week, and it's going to be a phenomenal week. It's going to be an amazing week. And um, there's like 82 volunteers, and we are just, um, I am really proud of that, that uh, you would come alongside and give of your time. And I got to tell you, it's an investment in children. And it's, it's a great investment to make. And they're going to have all kinds of fun. The kids are going to have a blast. And the volunteers will have a blast. But the best thing is, is that kids this week are going to discover, some for the first time, that Jesus loves them very much. And, you know, for some children, this may be the highlight of their entire summer. So no pressure, volunteers. And, uh... (laughs) but your participation really makes this happen. So if you're at the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down, and grab your offering buckets. Hold that for just a moment. We're also going to be praying for our VBS uh, this week and all our workers and all these kids that will fill this building 
uh, this week with energy, all right? So um, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for every dollar and every dime. And Lord, we recognize that in your hand, that God, um, you can take that which we give and you can move it into your kingdom purposes. And God, we ask that very thing. Lord, this week, as we are a part of... um, coming alongside children and, and allowing them to discover, some for the first time, others as a, a reaffirming that Jesus loves them very much. And God, what an awesome responsibility. I believe this week that a child's life will be changed for the kingdom in Jesus' name. I believe this week that families this week will be changed because of a a child's decision that they make to follow Jesus and the influence that it will bring back into their family. I believe it will set another kid on a direction that will take them away from where they were going and into a place, Lord, that you have called them, a purpose for which you've called them. And Lord, we are a part of that this week, this church. And Lord, not everyone could volunteer, and not everyone could be a part, but Lord, as they give of their tithes, and give of their offering, it allows this church to be a part of something much greater than what we could have done on our own. And so Lord, we thank you. We pray your grace on it all. And everybody said... Amen. All right. If you pass that along the aisle. And I got to tell you, folks, what an exciting week. You can be praying with us each and every morning. We will be here about 7 a.m. every day and just getting ready for kids. And then it'll be pandemonium for about four and a half hours. And then uh, we'll let the building rest for a few hours and then we'll do it all over again the next day. All right. So be praying for us. Um, Really, there's a spiritual battle that goes on when you begin to affect the lives of people. And it will be in evidence this week, I assure you. So stand with us. You're going to see it today in the message, the power of prayer. And I uh, just want you to be a part of that today. All right. Uh, a couple other things just before we jump into the message here this morning. Um, Saturday night, we will, we will resume. I know we've changed the date on you a little bit, but we will resume the Saturday night after uh, Labor Day. And the reason for that, it not only allows us to continue to uh, fix up the space in the box where we'll be hosting Saturday night service, but it, just, it really just increases that break that is necessary and needed by so many. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I just want to just give you a heads up in regards to that. And also, Bill, Bill are you here at the Skeet this morning? Every week, Bill reminds me, can you give me an update? He says it just like that. Can you give me an update on our six-month goals or our goals for the year? And so last week, he just about tore a strip off me at the door. And I'm embarrassing him now because he, you know, anyway, so, so he, get him. That's right. This is the halfway point of the year. Can you believe we'll soon be talking about Christmas decorations? They will be showing up at Walmart in about six weeks, right? Trees will be showing up. Uh, you can do your Christmas pre-order like any time now. I mean, it's amazing. Half of the year is now gone. And so I just want to give you um, just a quick up-to-date on some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, one of the areas of security that we've been working on is the closing of the alley. We are near the finish line in that process. Many of you do not know that that road that runs between here and the kids and the Spanish buildings and everything else, we do not own. That is a public road, and, and we run back and forth with reckless abandon on there. That is a public road, and we, have been, um, we are ready to present um, everything to the city to have them basically uh, allow us to shut that road down, and that just not only increases our, our, our land space, but just... Uh, allows for no cars to be going through there while children are present. And so also we're working on some things with closed circuit televisions. We are living in that day and age where security is an issue. And uh, so just wanted to give you a quick update in regards to that. Um, I just erased my message. Isn't that neat? No, I just uh, erased the offering. I'm just... In conclusion, and I've uh, been talking a little bit about parenting of churches, and I got to tell you, there is a passion in my heart that burns for this, this idea of coming along congregations. We, we may not have uh, financial strength yet in this congregation, but we have something that many churches would absolutely just, uh, they, 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 they pray for, and that's the resources of people. 
that are ready to do ministry. And uh, we're very excited about that. I did not realize how lengthy a process this would be. Had some meetings again in Orange County this or a week ago in regards to this, but uh, looking forward to the opportunity to come alongside some churches that uh, just could um, use some good folks from San Jacinto Assembly to, to help them move along. As far as growth, I get asked all the time, are we growing? Well, in the summertime, it's always hard to know, but our stats tell us that we're up, um, you know, in the single digit percentage wise, and so that's good, and uh, of course, there's always room for more, and you can be a part of that just by bringing someone alongside with you, and um, staffing and, and, ex- and expansion was one of the things that we put on our goal list um, over across the street in what we all call it the We Care building, but it's, 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 it's our building, but uh, We Care uses that, but we are splitting that, that building in half. There is, uh, there's a new wall going up in there and, uh, and some redecorating and rearranging going on because spiritual care has become a, a ministry that, um, you know, I always believed in it, but it has far exceeded my expectations, and I think it's one of the most vital things that we do here at San Jacinto Assembly. I believe everyone, somewhere along in their spiritual journey and process, should come to a spiritual care session. I really do believe that. I think it's essential. Because of that, though, we're needing to make a designated space for that, and so that is going on right now, and I think some folks that are helping along and getting that built and who have helped fund that and so on and so forth, and so that's great. Uh, as far as staffing, that's obviously an issue that we're still looking at. And then let me hit the last one. You will see a snapshot in your connections today, a financial snapshot. But um, about two or uh, 30 months ago, 20 months ago, I felt like the Lord said that we would, um, when we hit spring of that year, that we would no longer struggle. And, you know, God, it, God is faithful to his promises. And the very day before spring, he answered incre- that incredible prayer that we've been asking for three years. We found some relief and a reprieve in regards to our finances. And we've been living what I would call on manna. He provides every day, every day, every day, every day. And I've been asking the Lord, Lord, okay, manna, I get, it's good. But when do we move into the time where there is plenty? When do we move into the time where it's the promised land and we begin to move into that which you've called us to do? And I believe that's where God is taking us right now in this season. That will require steps of obedience and faith. But I got to tell you, I'm very, very excited about what is coming. And uh, finances, you know, they're, they're a reality. And for many folks, that's too business to be talking about the finances. But folks, as we talked about in regards to uh, VBS and having a great time with our kids this week, it wouldn't happen unless people came alongside and they gave. And so I just want to thank you for that. So there's your update, Bill. And uh, don't ask me for six months. All right, Bill? Very good. Okay. Hey, have you ever lived in the tension of the moment? How many of you remember your first kiss? Come on. Let's, let's be, come on. Put your hands up. Perhaps, perhaps you are leaning in for your very first kiss, right? And you missed, (laughs) right? There's that awkward moment in the formation of a relationship where you go, is this a good time? Or like, do I put my arm around? Do I hold her hand? When do I kiss her? All that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you, when you're going for that first kiss, there is tension. And it just is an awkward moment where spit meets spit, and it's just kind of gross. And you just might decide, I don't like this. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially... Well, anyways, we'll just... But I got to tell you, there are, there are tension moments in our life, and, 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 and there are other moments, like meeting someone important, like our mayor, Mark Bartell, that creates all kinds of tension in people's lives, right? Now, Mark's one of the most approachable guys in the world, but you know what I mean? Sometimes we meet someone that is, you know, either famous or something else, and we get all kind of flustered, don't know what to do, or this is one of my favorite, the boss calls us in, and we don't know why, and that creates tension and there are moments in our life that seemingly make our heart skip a beat or two or three even and 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 you know your your life story has seasons of tension in it 
as does mine. And, 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 and what makes for a, and that makes for a great story. As, as a kid, I love story, and, and nothing has changed. Uh, I, I enjoy a story that creates tension in the plot. Now, here's a quote about the story we will look at today, and it says this. This story is one of great dramatic power in which incident after incident is related until the climax of difficulty is reached. The knot is so tied that it seems impossible to escape. I guess why I like that quote is I'm so glad that that tension is happen happening for somebody else and not me. Right? I mean, it sounds pretty good. It's an intriguing plot. And, and that incident after incident, the tension building it by each moment. And folks, the fact of the matter is, it would be nice if we could just live in other people's tension by way of story and only experience it through that and not have to experience for ourselves. And yet then I look around and I recognize that some people like to live in drama. Right? And I don't get that either. But here's the deal today. Tension is, is created in what we call what-to-do moments. And these moments will determine, determine whether we are a difference maker or not. Now, confession. This is, this is totally a chauvinist thing, but sometimes I have been absolutely blind to the contribution of women in regards to Scripture, and yet, man, I don't know how, even from a man's perspective, that I could miss the power of, of Esther's story. The story of the deliverance of a nation, saving her people from uh, certain destruction. In that context, in that culture, she was truly a difference-making woman. So what makes Esther a difference-maker, and what can we do, or what can we take from her life? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn into uh, the book of Esther. That's in the Old Testament. If you're pulling that up digitally, go for it. But um, we will spend a little bit of time in chapter 4. I think there's... Some tension-making verses there we'll hit in just a moment. But what can we take away from the life of Esther? Number one, she's an immigrant. Number two, she's an orphan. Number three, she's raised by an uncle as his own. She's, uh, this is my favorite, she's a beauty contest winner who believes in world peace. I love that, sorry. So far, nothing screams difference maker about her life, right? Except that she is a young woman that understands that to be a true difference maker, one may have to forge ahead alone. And that is exactly what she does with some coaxing, I might add. In chapter 4, the tension that makes this such a great story is here in context. The king, you see has to make an example of the last, uh, last queen because she's defiant. So he gets rid of her. <laughs> the king is now searching for a replacement, and he's a patient man. He will allow a period of about a year for those that are prepared for him to choose from are readied. Wow, quite a process, huh? A year. But that's how Esther comes into the king's life. Now, her uncle Mordecai, up to this point, is still playing a very significant role in her life. There's also an ally to the king who is an enemy to the Jews by the name of Haman. And he gets um, a decree made by some dubious um, shenanigans that all the Jews in the land should be destroyed. Also, you have to understand that depending on the mood of the king, coming into his court um, could be detrimental for your life. And Esther is hesitant, even as the chosen queen, to go into his presence without being invited and then we find here in chapter four this incredible challenge from her uncle to his niece about her perceived immunity beginning at verse 12 it says this when esther's words were reported to mordecai he sent back this answer do not think because you are in the king's house you alone of all the jews will escape for if you re remain silent at this time, relief and deliver deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And you know, and who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time 
is this. That's what most of us understand about Esther, a time such as this. But it goes on, verse 15, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. It, those, those are some of the most brave words of Scripture. And if I perish, I perish. In, in these few verses here, some, some great spiritual truth and tools are put forward for us. Um, number one, the understanding of God's timing uh, often comes in seasons in our life. And I think many of us have experienced that if we've been in Christ any length of time. That there are seasons where there's times where we will take incredible steps of faith. Secondly, that the realization to do God's will will require that we die to self. That is not just a New Testament principle that Christ speaks about in taking up the cross daily, but it is also an Old Testament principle as well. And then as I mentioned in regards to prayer, she will not even begin to consider this unless she knows that there are a group of people that are praying for her. She will not consider this unless she knows that she is prayed up herself and that those that she's in alliance with are fasting and praying. And that's why I said to you what I said in regards to our children this week. We absolutely need to join our hearts together to pray. Some of you should consider fasting this week. If the Lord lays that on your heart, be fasting for our kids because I will tell you that, folks, these kids will be carrying in all kinds of life issues. And this will be the safest environment for them all week long. But I believe that God wants to change lives this week, and that includes the lives of children. And so for that to happen, I believe it's the responsibility of the church that it rises up and prays and supports that, which God's kingdom message is to do, is to take this gospel all over the world. And we will have that opportunity to do that. But without prayer without preparing our hearts, without preparing that which we need to do, we will become less effective than we could be. So the rest of the story here is that we know Esther is received into the king's court. And she invites the king and Haman, by the way, she invites them to not one, but two banquets. And the king discovers at the second banquet, that, uh, or just before the banquet, of, the, of that second banquet, that Esther's uncle was never properly honored for uncovering a, um, a coup or uncovering a, a, an assassination plot against the king. And so he wants to honor Mordecai and he asks Naaman, not knowing that Naaman has, has some real hate on for Mordecai. And at the second banquet, we, we come to re recognize that there's a lot going on here. And just before Haman leaves, his wife, his wife speaks into his life and recognizes that God's providence is on this scene and that the path, the destructive path that Haman has been on, she is saying is going to be to his demise. And so she knows that something terrible is going to happen. And it's at that second banquet that Esther reveals her identity as a Jew. And then she points out that Haman is the orchestrator of this plot to destroy her people and that the, the, the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai and for other Jews to follow would now be his own fate. It's quite a story. And in your extra reading this week, I would encourage you to read the book of Esther. It's a great story. But what we see in the pages and the tension and the buildup by moment by moment, we see that, that the tension not only is significant, but it is life-changing. You see, there is breakthrough in this situation in that is seemingly impossible. Now here's the takeaway for you today. When tension hits your life with no solution on the horizon, believe this today because of who Christ is in your life, God has declared breakthrough for you. Now for some of you, you should be shouting in joy for that. You should just be excited to no end. Did you hear what the Word of God has is saying about the tension and the stuff that is going on in your life? He has declared breakthrough for you. He has declared that greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. You see, folks, we sometimes live like our faith is just by chance and stuff will somehow just kind of eh, 
seek out. But I'm telling you that God has declared and spoken over your life breakthrough. Now, Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, you're going, hey, didn't you use this verse last week? Yes, I did. That's my prerogative to go ahead and use it again, all right? So when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And some of you are going, well, that's too Old Testament for me. So, okay, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. I always like this. There's a really big bear in this story. I'm telling you, right? Here it is. And God is faithful. I said, God is faithful. I wish I was an African-American pastor right at this moment because that would have lit up the room right there. Thank you very much. I'll, I see that witness. There we go. That's right. God is faithful. Right? And it's not by accident. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But you're going, it's a big bear. I know, I've seen it. Right? Folks, i got to tell you that spiritual lethargy has this kind of wandering in me, just kind of floating around like, you know, our spiritual life is just going to happen by accident. And I'm telling you that sometimes there is very deliberate action and that the tension that is allowed to be created in your life is so that breakthrough can come. And breakthrough, for some of you are going, it's too spiritual. It's not practical enough. That's hooey, okay? That's just, folks, I got to tell you that breakthrough, when did we stop believing that breakthrough was going to come into our lives? When did we stop believing? When did we start buying onto this idea that somehow God is not powerful? But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Some of you have extreme tension building in your life today. Some of you have a situation where you've lost any sense of hope that breakthrough can come. I'm telling you that breakthrough is on your horizon. I believe that for your life. I know it's true. I've seen it happen in my own life. And I've seen it happen in many of your lives. You're going, well, God already did that once. I've already used my chip. Because someone told me he only does that once and then, then, you know, from there I'm on my own. No. No. Spiritual breakthrough will come. I'm also reminded that no weapon formed against us will stand. You see, it was fitting that we sang that one song because even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want you to know today that you do not have to fear evil. Now, folks, I'm your pastor. I'm honored to be your pastor. And sometimes I have my doubting moments. I go, whoo, this is a big one. Okay, God, this one is significantly large where I'm actually thinking maybe, maybe it's not going to work out this time. And you know what? I watch as God goes, hmm, think so, huh? And sometimes he does it in the immediate. Sometimes he allows me to live in that tension so that I will trust him, prepare my life, and then take bold action. Is that not what Esther did? And what happened when she did that? Her nation was saved. Folks, i got to tell you that God is causing us for us moments by allowing that which is happening in our lives and says, I tell you what, I know that sin is, is creating this stuff, but listen, you're going to grow through this. You're going to have a chance to rise above this, and I will bring breakthrough in your life if you will just trust me with the answer for how this is going to play out. And folks, i got to tell you, I believe that. I know it's true, and you should believe it too, because corporately today, you know, we celebrate faith, and that's, that's important. But I also recognize that many of us will have those deep and dark moments, often in private, where we begin to struggle with what God's Word is saying to us. But let me, let me pose the alternative for, to you for just a moment. If you can't trust God for breakthrough, 
then, then what you're doing is trusting in yourself. And all that does is cement in you what you've done before that got you into that mess in the first place. You see, the patterns of our spiritual weakness will not be strengthened or rectified or declared gone unless we make a change or a move and recognize that God is able in our situation. On the surface, it seems like a no-brainer because everyone in the room is going, that's right, that's right. He is my deliverer. He is my Savior. He can do this. He, he, he's got my back and, and, and all that, but sometime along this journey, something will engage us that will strike fear into our heart. And we'll wrestle. Have you ever wrestled? I, I know you've wrestled, but have you ever wrestled with, ever wrestled with God? You know, when you wrestle with God, it's a great sermon. I'm not going to preach that one right now. But there will be seasons where we will wrestle with God. And if we have a heart to follow after Him, He will touch us. Now, it may weaken us in another area as we continue to move forward, but that which He has spoken into our life will still come through even in the weakness that has now been placed into our lives. And you're going, oh, 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 I don't like talk about weakness. I like the victor concept. You know, I am a mighty warrior and stuff. I'll tell you what, every warrior takes a beating somewhere along the way. Right? And folks, God wants to set people free. God wants to break some of the chains or the chains that are upon your lives. He wants to do that which he said he would do. We have to believe it. We have to ask for it. We have to move in that. Now I recognize that we just celebrated Independence Day and this nation above any of the world is most blessed and they understand individual rights better than anyone. But it's also evident to me that we, we live very interdependent lives, even with faith. Well, Scripture is clear that we should not give up coming together and fellowshipping together and having interaction. It must be recognized as well that our growth in Christ involves moments where we break free from the safety mode or the safety net of our peers and move boldly and recklessly for the things of God. And that's hard. Because it's, there's safety in numbers. Right? Safety in numbers. You know, as a kid, when I was playing tag and all that kind of stuff, if you got tired, what I would always do is hang out with the slower kids because I figured if, if I hang out with the slower kids, if someone's coming, at least they'll get the slower kid. They won't get me. Right? And so you just kind of leverage against that, always positioning yourself that, okay, they won't get me, but they'll get somebody else. Tough for them. But folks, i got to tell you that we can't live in that mindset that someone else is going to get wiped out. We need to live into the mindset today that he is calling us to boldly go. Oh man, I want to use a Star Trek quote, right? <laughs> but some men have gone, some women have gone. Esther went there. And what happened? She didn't go there with the idea that it was all going to be great. Because she says, and if I perish, I perish. In other words, she's gone. She's dead. I perish. It's essential that you and I remember where we came from and in turn encourage others to take steps or leaps of faith with the opportunities that are before them. So, Esther is an immigrant. She's an orphan. She grew up displaced. And you and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not of this world. We are aliens to this world. We live here, but we're not a part of this world, and we understand what it means to be displaced. And even as, as believers, oftentimes as we achieve success in this world and are placed in positions of power and 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 and, and, and you know, authority, 
It requires strength and, and, and beauty of character for that person to remember where they've come from, the simple origins. I've, I've, met, many, I've met many folks in my life, and I, I've met some very poor folks that married very rich. I've got to tell a story. I hope they're not watching today. Good chance they're not, so here we go. I have a buddy who is loaded. He marries a young lady who is just poor. Poor, 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 poor. And she has the gift of giving. I love this. She figures her husband doesn't have a clue how much he has. Not so. He's not wealthy by not paying attention. Right? But she never forgets where she came from. She now lives in affluence, can buy anything they want, literally. But she does not forget she has, they live in this huge home, and she hires a, <laughs> I love this, she, she hires a, a, a housekeeper. And the housekeeper has like 73 kids. I don't know how many it is. But they all need braces. And so she goes, I think I'll put all your kids in braces. My husband will never know. I'm having lunch with him. And he goes, do you want to know what my wife's doing right now? I says, sure. He goes, she is buying braces for every poor kid in our city. <laughs> and I think it's fabulous. But I'm not going to tell her because that would wreck the joy she's having. <laughs> I love that story. I also love the story of the time that she got so mad at him that she went out and bought a, a, a grand piano and had it delivered to the house. <laughs> she doesn't even play piano. She just did it to get back at him for something. That's, okay, that's a different story. <laughs> but there was that, she didn't forget who she was. She didn't forget where she came from. And she wasn't ashamed of her very humble origins. And she recognized that God had now placed her in a position and she was using that position to help other people. Folks, do not fall into the trap of thinking something like this. If I were only in Esther's place with all those great opportunities before me, then I would trust God and I would see him glorified. And I, I'll, I'm going to tell you, the fact of the matter is, you just don't rise up to that place unless you have taken steps of faith. Because how can God trust you with that if he hasn't seen it yet on your radar? Right? Scripturally, it says, he who can be trusted with little will be given, what? Much. And so, you want to do something great with, for God? Then be faithful with what he has asked you to do today. Today. Don't wait for tomorrow's opportunity. Move in the opportunities that are before you today. They're all around this place, but you're going, ah, oh, the one I'm in today has way too much tension attached to it. I don't want to move in that. I want to move into something easier that I haven't had to think through for months and months and months and months. I want a new tension-filled opportunity. I am tired of my old one. And folks, I'm telling you, that be faithful with what God has given into your hand today to do. If you do not know what to do with it, Scripture, one of my favorite scriptures, and I quote it all the time, says that if any of you lacks wisdom, what should you do? You should ask. Who are you supposed to ask? Everyone around you? Well, yeah, that's nice. But why don't you ask God? Because he's the one that knows how to get you through that which you are responding to and trying to move forward in. Now, I've got to tell you that there are unparalleled opportunities all around us. And again, I've said it a million times today, we're going to have opportunities with kids. And those of you volunteers that are here today, I am so in love with you today. Because you know what? 
I recognize that when you kept signing up to volunteer, that God placed you on my heart to be praying for. I've been praying for you, and some of you have been in some real battles right up to this moment. And I've got to tell you, it's not going to get any better this week. But you're going to begin to see the victory unfold as you begin to push beyond that. And you, you know, go, I don't know. I, I, I don't. Ah. Esther says, and if I perish, I perish. Folks, when you begin to move into that which God has called you to do, it requires, it requires a difference-making decision, a difference-making lifestyle that moves you to a place where He is glorified. If you've got your connection card, I'm going to go ahead, ask you to go ahead and pull that out with me, please. On the front side, if you're our guest today, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to have you, especially in the summer. So great to have you here with us today. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill out the information that's there, we're not going to call you. People get freaked out anymore when you call them on the phone. So we're not going to call you. We're going to tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to send you an email tomorrow, and we're going to send you a letter. You'll probably get it like on Thursday. And um, we're interested in doing life with you. And um, maybe you're trying to figure out how that goes. Well, Responding back to that, we will begin that journey together, all right? And so if you take a moment, and uh, also any of those of you that have come here regularly, changed your personal information, if you would note that for us, that's great. Why don't you go ahead and turn around to the back side, and uh, you could sign up for the church picnic today. That helps us know how much meat we should order, right? Uh, we have a water baptism service coming up at the end of the month. If you'd go ahead and if you'd like to be baptized, mark that off. We also have a uh, Rise Up Worship Dance Group that we'll talk to you about, oh, probably next week. We're still finishing up some of the details on that. But I want to draw your attention to this. My next step today is, you could memorize all of Esther 4.16. It's quite long, but the part I just want you to drive into your head today is this. And if I perish, I perish. You just memorize the verse. Well, the last part. But if I perish, I perish. Oftentimes when we are trying to make a spiritual decision to move forward, we are considering everything that we're going to lose. Have you ever been there? God, I can't move forward today because it means this. Or I will lose that. Or we begin to fabricate all kinds of crazy things that will happen in our lives if we were to move forward. But I just got to tell you, we move forward because that's what he's called us to do. He's called us to. Well, we'll get there. Extra reading. The book of Esther. Read it this week. It's a powerful book. And here's your three next step points. Where is God calling you to be a difference maker today? And if I can add to it, recognize he may be calling you to go alone. Where is God calling you to be a difference maker today? And he may be calling you to go alone. Don't surpri be surprised if you go alone that no one's following for a very long time. But the testimony of your life and that which God begins to unfold because you are faithful and because you are breaking through that which has been laboring against you for so very long, that gets recognized and people begin to go, wait a second, I just see faith in action. I see something that is very real and is that true for me too, God? If I would take steps, it is true. It's true for them. It's true for me. So where is God calling you to be a difference maker? Number two, are you prepared to perish? It's a great word. I was looking for maybe a more contemporary word, but, but perish just says it all. Perish. Are you ready to perish for his sake? Again, it's the same principle we're talking about in point one. But making that decision. There was an old song we used to sing, used to get sung most times as people were coming to an altar. Many of you know it, right? Though none go with me, still I will follow. Right? And there's a line in there that says, no turning back. No turning back. It's a great, it's a great old song. It's a spiritual truth. And that truth is very much alive for you today. Thirdly, 
Can you see the opportunity that's around you? Mordecai had to remind his adopted daughter or his niece. Why did she think she was immune to that which was coming? When all of a sudden she recognized that she would not be immune and that this was an opportunity, she saw the opportunity that God was laying before her. So, so oftentimes we, and I'm, I'm so guilty of this, I, I, I live by my calendar and my day timer and I, and I stack appointment after appointment after appointment. I like sometimes the routine of just powering through. But sometimes that type of lifestyle, when that bleeds into the other things I do, it causes me to miss the very opportunity that's before me. And then I'll have these moments alone in the car as I'm driving home where the Lord kind of feels like He's hitting me in the side of the head going, duh, you missed it. What? You missed the opportunity I brought before you today. Well, I was in an opportunity. And the argument, I never win. Where it's, yeah, but you missed the one that I had brought to you today to deal with. And folks, I know we want to get from here to there. We want to be expedient. We want to do all those types of things. We want to run into Target without makeup on, hope we don't see anyone, all that kind of stuff, right? Not speaking from experience on that one, all right. Oftentimes, God has another plan. And His plan for you is amazing. It's amazing. It is so incredible. Yet we're waffling with the tension of right here and that tension be so paralyzing. And we even begin to say stuff like this. I can't add another thing to my life. <gasps> Breakthrough. I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we go to worship. And as we go to worship today, I want to encourage those of you that need breakthrough in an area of your life. I'm going to encourage you to worship with reckless abandon here in these next few moments. I'm going to encourage you to lift a hand to the Lord and say, God, you know what I need today. But I will die to self. I will recognize that which you've placed for me today to be responsible with. And God, I am believing for breakthrough. Folks, if no one's life was cha not changed, we didn't have church. I believe God wants to change lives, and change the situations and the circumstances that many are living in today. Because I know I'm going to see it happen all week with children doesn't want to do it just in kids. He wants to do it in big kids, just like you. Would you worship with us? Then I'll call us to prayer in just a few moments. Let's worship together.